Good morning, Portland. Scattered showers once again and temperatures on the cool side. Mid 40s out the door and only mid 50s this afternoon. Watch out for a hail shower as well. A safe rest village for the homeless set to open as soon as next month in Multnomah Village could be the first of six in Portland. President Biden is expected to discuss infrastructure when he visits Portland, Oregon later today. The White House says Biden will talk about his efforts to, quote, continue bringing down costs for American families. Good morning, everybody. It's 5.50. I got breakfast sandwiches, hot coffee, got some decaf. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I've been in this shelter from the beginning when it first opened. I'm 60 years old. I'm the oldest one in here. <laughs> This shelter actually is, you don't understand, this shelter is a royal palace for me. Even though we are sleeping in a mat, I call this a twin bed. Not, not a mat, but a twin bed. Okay, let's go. This is our everyday routine, every day. This is what we do. By six o'clock, I have to be out of here because my schedule is at seven o'clock. Let's go. I have to hurry up and go to work. Let's go be. In Pearl District, there's a lot of empty apartments. It's just too expensive for other people to afford it. I work for a Rite Aid and I'm a floor supervisor. That is a regular nine to five job. I don't look like I'm homeless, but I am. Our outside guests at 6.30. And so I get their meal ready first. My name is April O'Connor and I'm a breakfast chef at Blanche House. Oops. <laughs> it's like I'm a witch with my very own square cauldron. And I like to be able to say that I feed hundreds of hungry people every day. We'll serve about, I want to say over a thousand meals a day. Me personally, you know, I'm, I've been through homelessness before. This is what the volunteers will scoop from when they're on the line dishing up for service. They're all set up over okay. there, hopefully. Five minutes. It seems like there's a huge crisis at the moment. The need of a lot of people right now. Get two minutes. Apple, oatmeal, and donuts. Coffee with cream and sugar in it. Good morning. Here we are. I think it's an increasing problem that people don't know what to do about. People don't know what to help. People don't understand the complexity of the roots of the problems. More and more people are slipping through the cracks. So that's what we're here for. We're in Portland, we're on 102nd and Woodstock. We call it the gravel pit. Different areas have different names, but this is the pit. You know, this, this ain't nice. Nobody wants to live like this. My name's Kimmy Murray and um, I'm 53 years old and I'm homeless. I'm vision impaired and disabled. Me and my husband alone have put in hours to get help from different agencies, churches, you name it. We're doing the footwork. We have an income, but you see where we are. 
if I'm not 55, not pregnant, don't have a kid under 18, or a major drug addict in treatment or going through mental health, I can't get no help. My family can't get no help. Really, we just get up and the wife and I pray in the morning and uh, just kind of get a fire going to warm up because it's usually pretty chilly out in the morning. This tent was given to us by a friend because um, somebody ransacked our other one. And then we get it, my husband got it set up and then it started flooding. So a friend of ours um, gave us a case of really huge diapers and we have them down on the floor soaking up the water. As you see, no matter what, we're sticking together, so. Yeah, it's, it gets hard. The city looks at the homeless problem as a nuisance, as an inconvenience, you know, because the Rose City, you know, roses die too. When I lost my home, my rose wilted. It hasn't died yet because I'm not giving up. There's something out there for me, for my family. I don't know if, if the city told them to move or or what, but they're, they're definitely not here, so we're cleaning up the mess. They make the neighbors happy too. We need a shovel guy. We pick up about 6,000 pounds a day, between five and 6,000 pounds every day. Quarter million pounds of garbage in the last three months. I'm going to unroll. I'll pull up right there, we'll take that stuff right there, we'll load up right down there. It's tough these days. We got a lot of homelessness, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. We clean an area. And two weeks later, I'll be cleaning this same area. So um, it's, it's an ongoing problem. Um, it, I don't know what the answer is, but um, we're just trying to help them out. Rock in the middle. Over the rock, through the woods. You know, we got to become some kind of housing for them. OK, let's put all the tools in there, and let's rock and roll. So she right. can go straight, and I'll back out that truck, and we go to the dump. One, two, three, up. I don't know all the answers, but we got a lot of work to do. Wanna get your shoes on? Brush your hair. Brush my hair. Oh, you want me to brush your hair now? Okay. Are you good at sharing? Do you know how to spell your name? Her name's Skylar, she's five. Whenever I'm having a bad day, she come around and like, Mom, I love you, you're my best friend. Like, it just makes me so much better about my day. I'm Tiana, I'm 26 years old, and this is the tiny house that moves. And then this is my bed where I sleep, and there's where we drive and everything. The kitchen, you know, it's not the biggest, but then I got bunk beds over here. This is where Scholar's bed is and it's where we keep our laundry usually. <laughs> the first day I got it, the oven door kind of fell off. So we haven't been able to bake anything. We have a microwave and a stove, but it's not like, like I'd love to bake a tater tot casserole or a pizza or something. We were in a neighborhood where the neighbors didn't really like us because you know, sometimes they get kind of mad about people in their RVs and stuff. And I told them the first night we pulled up there, they came out, I said, I'm pregnant, I'm working, I'm clean. You know, I just want a nice quiet place to sleep. Please, I won't cause you problems if you don't cause me problems. But eventually, I mean, we got our windows shot out. We had neighbors come out, like a gang of them against us. And we're like telling us, you know, we'll pay you to leave. I'm like, okay, fine, we're going like, I didn't even want the money. I didn't even get the money. I just left like out of their way, okay? It's impossible to find anywhere to stay without one neighbor getting mad at you. We're getting on the freeway. Woo. Sometimes it would be nice to have like a more permanent home for water and power and all that. 
It's a little rough sometimes, yeah. We used to live in an apartment, but she calls it a compartment. She tells me she wishes we could go back to our compartment. <laughs> you miss it? Yeah. So today we're doing a community wellness fair, which is something that we kind of just started as a pilot um, project in Lentz neighborhood in the fall. We bring resources out to the community. So we have food, haircuts. Do you want to do it really quickly? Sure. My name is Crystal Delahancy with PDX Saints Love. I really like um, being able to have personal conversations. How long have you been um, in a car without a home? I'm gonna cut this gentleman's hair. I know when I was living outside, I, um, I struggled off and on for years. So how long have you been um, out of prison? I got released on July 8th of 2019. And then I got certified as a peer wellness specialist. So I get to give back to the community that I've taken away from. Right, right. So my life story is just kind of, um, kind of started out a little bit rough. My mom was married to somebody who um, physically abused me. Rather than continue to endure abuse, I just started running away. Yeah. During that time, I got addicted. Um, to just any kind of drug. I ended up outside, I lost my house, um, I lost my job. I've been clean and inside for 10 years now. I had to come back out and just tell people like there's hope and like we can do something different. Yeah, looking good. Definitely possible awesome. and, um, and just worth it. Appreciate it's it. It's worth it. Hi. <laughs> So basically, we load everything up in the morning and we come over and we get everything set up. It's, it's kind of quite a process. Make sure everything's running and the showers are hot. How's that temperature? Is it steamy? It's really warm, yes. Go. It works perfect. We clean everything, disinfect it, get it all ready for people. You know, there's people that haven't showered for a year, you know, that come to us. And, and so amazing to look yep. at their faces when they walk out of the shower. You know, they're like a new person, you know, washing away all that stress and the life that, you know, unfortunately, some people have to be in. My nickname is Blue. I've been homeless for 11 years. I don't ask for anything, you know, but this is the thing that matters is that I get a shower and a hot shower at that. It gets me ahead. I'll get the lights going for you. Well, I feel like a king. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Lord, thank you. <laughs> My name is Richard Bruno. I'm the Senior Medical Director for Primary Care at Central City Concern. Being without housing can be really difficult to maintain and keep your health up. So a lot of folks who struggle with diabetes, for example, don't have refrigerators to store their insulin in. Uh, a lot of folks who have chronic wounds in their feet uh, are made worse because they're kind of walking around uh, in shoes or socks that haven't been, uh, that may be uh, unhygienic. And drain it out. Okay. Drain this is looking good back here. It was really this, painful for a while, man. Do, do you have any feeling in your toe here? Um, I have more now. You can feel a little bit more? Yeah. But not at the tip. Well, what can the a lot of folks will come see us because they hear that we can provide services with low barriers to entry. We have you know, walk-in clinic. We have a lot of substance use uh, services and mental health services that people can get same day. 90 day stay or 60 day stay at RCP? Yeah, so the RCP stay is basically for your feet. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was just to kind of keep you out of the hospital, make sure you have some place stable right. so you can heal and make sure we we're seeing you re regularly for that wound care. Mm -hmm. And then after that, yeah, you won't need like the medical housing really. Mm -hmm. Our team here will help you. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about all your options and we'll try and get you into some housing. For folks who are really struggling right now, we really believe that being able to provide this type of care to people uh, where they may have been turned away from other organizations or uh, been let down by a healthcare system that has a lot of holes in it. We help kind of fill those holes and we help kind of lift people up. And it really is a really rewarding thing to do.
President Joe Biden will stop in Portland today to tout federal infrastructure spending. My name is Susan Lind, and I'm thinking maybe he should come down and see how some of these people are living. Uh, mic check, mic check, one, two, one, two. Mic check, mic check. You guys hear us? Yep, I hear you. This is a live picture from the Air National Guard base at PDX, where Air Force One is landing as we speak. Maybe, you know, it'll bring a little reality to the situation. This, of course, is President Biden's first visit to Oregon since taking office. He'll talk up the big $1 trillion package he signed into law last fall. And these people have no other place but to be here. And it looks like the president is uh, on the ground now. But he will be leaving momentarily from PDX. He will be heading to a private fundraiser at the Portland Yacht Club on Northeast Marine Drive. This area really has been filled with police, Secret Service all day long and looky-loos. Some were excited to see him. Others also said that they hoped Biden would see the reality that so many Portlanders are familiar with when it comes to homelessness in the city. People who live around here specifically mentioned that they hoped the president would pass the area of Marine Drive and 33rd Avenue, an area known for its homeless camps. Bothers the heck out of me that there's this belief that we can't do big things anymore, but we can. It's just really hard. It's rough, you know. Anything's possible in America. Anything's possible. And that's what we're exactly what we're going to do today. Do what we are capable of doing. Stop feeling sorry for ourselves. Get the hell up and take this country back in a way that we lead the world again, because we can do it. I mean it. There's nothing beyond our capacity. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's great being a part of this, this community. Uh, I think that this community here in Chinatown is really special. So this is Laundry. We're a vintage sportswear boutique. We specialize in uh, jerseys, team wear, t-shirts, snapbacks, caps, that type of thing. I may be one of the, the last or one of the few Chinese business owners in this neighborhood. I'm Chris. I'm the owner of Laundry. This spot has been, I don't want to say a curse, but you know, it's been good and bad. This is a neighborhood that is known for high-end streetwear. It's known for celebrities, but it's also known for crime, uh, drug addiction, mental illness. Some of the juxtapositions that you see in this neighborhood. This is, I think, even a little bit more than a machete, as you can see. This gentleman was brandishing this in the parking lot one day, um, striking cars and just swinging it around. There needs to be like some standard of safety, right? I think that this idea that, uh, that more liberty equals more empathy is flawed. I think that um, the amount of liberty um, that in some cases we give to people is, is apathetic because all we do is we hang them out to be hurt, to suffer. The breed of houselessness that we see in this neighborhood is drug addicted. People don't want to see suffering, you know, people suffer enough. I don't think people understand how hard it is to, to, ch to live this kind of life, even if it's by, by choice, you know, or what we're describing as choice. Um, the, uh, the amount of pain and, and suffering and, and exploitation and just nastiness that we see out here is just, it's sad. There's this feeling that if you can stay alive in Chinatown, you can make it and you can grow and um, that, that what you're doing is working. Davis Street and Northeast Martin Luther King Boulevard to the northwest corners, the transient camp on fire. Ultimately, you know, we sign up to help people um, in their time of need. It's not our emergency, but it's the person who's calling. It's their emergency. So we take that to heart. We are there to always help. This is Truck 8. You calling? Copy. My name is Mike Dunbernstein. I work for Portland Fire. 911, what's the address of the emergency? Delta breathing issues, Southwest Natal Parkway, Burnside Bridge. I would say a bulk of the calls, definitely EMS, medical responses uh, for the most part, and that does include uh, the houseless population. Our call volume is not sustainable in its current capacity. The call volume, the call types, 
it's, it is stressful. As much as we want to help, it is a very stressful job. 313 on a party 210 Delta chest pain issue. But I don't believe it's sustainable. The call volumes aren't sustainable. And ultimately, uh, what these people that are experiencing houselessness need is, is not a fire apparatus. They, they need stable housing or they need health care coverage. They need mental health. Um, rehabilitation, drug rehabilitation. 23 Charlie, accidental overdose. Night Strike, I guess in a broad sense, is an event, an opportunity for a community to come together and serve our houseless population. So we try to at least make Night Strike a place where once a week they have a community they can rely on and they'll get things that they need, but they also can see their friends. My name is Anthony Georgette. I'm a staff volunteer here at Night Strike. What do you think about a beanie or something or a hat? We get people that, you know, they're sleeping in tents on the side of the street. We also get people who, you know, money is extremely tight. And by extremely tight, I mean they're getting help just so that they can pay their rent and have shelter, but they don't even have money for clothing. Foot washing station is exactly what it sounds like, right? So we make sure that the guest um, has everything that they need to go from, you know, the dirtiest feet that you've ever seen to the prettiest feet that they've ever had in their life. Having someone be able to come to your level and do something that might seem demeaning to you, but they take it and make it just, it's normal, and you, you deserve that just as much as anyone else. People are trying, they just need the help, for whatever reason. Maybe they're suffering with addiction, maybe it's a mental health crisis. I don't know, and to be honest, when I'm here, I don't really care, because what, what I see is somebody that needs underwear, for instance. That's what I know. And if that can help them get through the next week, a clean pair of underwear, and help them get an interview so they can get a job, so they can start supporting themselves, that's what I'm here for. I'm Dan Lindzen, co-owner at Dixie Tavern. Watch your feet. Yeah, there's always something going on, something unique, colorful. A lot of the services that help people that are in crisis or homeless, they don't operate when we operate. We then have to be the ad hoc services to help a lot of folks. We see it as part of what we have to do to be a neighbor. It's, it's like they're all part of our community. My name's Cameron, I'm the head of security here at Dixie Tavern. Yeah, 11 years I've been out here. Dixie boy. How you feeling? Huh? Okay, how you doing? Good. All right. Good. Is it working a little better now? Tune it again. Hell yeah. I worked for uh, Cascadia Behavioral Healthcare. I was a residential counselor a couple years ago. The training there, I think, has been instrumental in like kind of how I approach different situations and understanding, coming from a place of understanding and then working my way backwards, you know. More mental health, hang on, I got this. Hey, hey, stop it. You all right, brother? Me? Okay. Was that your tarp? Do you want, do you need that back? You just want to be left alone? Domestic kind of dispute right there between a guy and a girl. The girl punched him in the face and <laughs> took his tarp and <laughs> ran off. Seems like that, that well's running dry. You know, it's, it's hard for everybody out here, but I feel like it's something that we could, we could, I'm optimistic. So like I'll, I'll remain optimistic. 911, what is the address of the emergency? Uh, it's, uh, you need to get an ambulance. There's a gentleman here that's uh, having a heart attack. We do have medics being dispatched by my partner right now. We are the safety net for the houseless population. My name is Siobhan Gray. I'm an emergency physician at Legacy Good Samaritan. It's easier to come into the emergency department to get medical care. We can provide medical care, but not comprehensive medical care. I was having chest pains really bad and needed to call 911 but somebody took my phone it was brand new and i like i said had recent heart attack so i think i might maybe had another i don't know 
but that's why I wanted to go to the hospital. He is an example of a typical patient. They've had multiple hospitalizations, but they also have no housing. They will come to the ER very frequently. I was referred by social services in Vancouver and uh, ended up getting stuck up there, sent to a shelter. And the shelter sent me back to the hospital, the hospital back to the shelter, and it's just been crazy. So he has had two recent admissions this month, and in addition to that, has had about 150 ED visits over the last year. I'm an amputee, so I'm completely disabled. I can't really get around, and I have an infection in my other foot. It's so hard. You know, I mean, amputations, heart surgery, strokes, you know, all these really significant medical issues. And then, you know, not having any reliable follow-up or the ability to follow through with the follow-up you're provided is, it makes it very challenging. I don't know, I'm just uh, hoping to talk to maybe some type of a staff or social worker at the hospital that can tell me what my best options are. It feels broken. It feels like we don't have a good solution or, or resources and it's not how we want to provide medical care and what these patients deserve, but it's the system that we are in. One day, Portland will have to return to balance. We have to find some common ground, and I think that one day we will. One day I'd love to be able to see supportive housing for anybody who wants it. Walk a day in my shoes, my husband's shoes. Getting told, you're scum, you're dirt, get a job, blah, blah, blah. Because a lot can happen in one day, really. You wouldn't believe it, especially, you know, when people band together to help each other. We could get a lot done in one day. One day I'm gonna, I'm gonna have my own home, a job, a car, and I'm gonna actually be somebody. One day I will take off and you will never see me homeless again.